All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, this is a full room, so I have lots of people to disappoint in 20 short minutes. So I am Arjit Mukherjee. I'm CTO at a company called SignalFX. And we are here to talk about monitoring uh, Docker and Kubernetes environments. So SignalFX is a SaaS service that provides a service exactly like this, among other things. So this is a matter uh, close to my heart. Uh, but before we begin, I hope you guys all got a chance to hear the breaking news that came out just a little while ago. If not, I will repeat. Uh, it looks like the monoliths are gone. Uh, and what's taking their place uh, are microservices. And it's quite clear that Docker and Kubernetes are the platforms of choice, are the selection, you know, for, for these new environments. And what's happening is these environments are more complex. So observability is becoming far more important and far harder at the same time. You know, back in the day, Ryan, all the observability he needed was just that, you know, windscreen and a, and a rear view mirror, and if you ask me, both are questionable. But our friend Pete here, he needs a cockpit full of instruments to drive his jet plane. And he's not saying that, you know what, instruments are complicated, so I'm just gonna ride a horse. He doesn't say that because the jet plane lets him move faster. And that's exactly the case with these new environments. They are more complex, but they do let us move faster. But luckily for us, uh, there is no dearth of observability tools that are out there. Um, and so then the question is, for example, you know, Kubernetes and Docker, they have observability built in from the ground up. And it's quite easy to get started. In fact, there are multiple workshops at this conference that will tell you how to get started observing your Kubernetes environment, right? So then the question is, why are we here? So this talk is not about the basics. It's not about just getting started. I'm gonna talk about what comes after, because there are lots of things that are not covered in your getting started manual. There's gonna be problems that you're gonna run into, and with some careful thought and work, you can work around them. So we'll discuss a few of them in, in the interest of time. The first one that I wanna talk about is scale. So realize that you're gonna generate far more data that, than you used to back in the day. And there are many, many, many reasons for it. So I was at the AWS Summit a few weeks back, and Werner Vogels mentioned how uh, Amazon's S3 service is built with 33 different microservices and microservice teams, 33. And initially I was like, that feels like a bit too much. But then you, know, you realize that these guys are not fools, and this is an indication of where the future is. This is where we will be in a few years, if not there already. Uh, Tinder wrote a blog about, again, their you know, move, move to Kubernetes and, and, and Docker recently, and they do one thing called bin packing, where they're putting a lots of Kubernetes pods and containers in the same node, which means the amount of telemetry emitted by a node is exploding. If I want to monitor error rates, uh, I may just want to do the average error rate across my whole infrastructure, or perhaps I want to measure it per customer. When, when I do that, if I have hundreds of customers or thousands of customers, again, I'm generating more data. And last but definitely not least is the orchestration engine itself. This is the Kubernetes component model. It is a complex beast. Uh, all of these components do have observability built in. They will make telemetry available to you, but then that also is quite a lot of data. And why is that bad? Why is the scale problematic? First of all, if you think about what people do to handle all this scale, because you know, things might just fall over, is they will say, I'm gonna divide and conquer, right? So a common pattern we see is you have a Prometheus per Kubernetes cluster. The problem with that, while, while it does solve some problems, is that it's gonna fragment your use cases, right? So if I just wanted to answer a simple question, like how many nodes or how many containers do I have across all my clusters, that's not gonna work. Uh, the other problem with fragmentation is that there are some clusters that may write, you know, run hot, and so my Prometheus there might be sort of under stress and my observability is gonna suffer while I have a lot of free capacity in my other clusters. So it's not really a good way to utilize resources. Uh, how might you solve that problem? Firstly, if you have a lot of money, you can say, well, I'm gonna over provision. This is gonna solve your hotspots problem, obviously, right? But if you don't have so much money, uh, or actually, if you wanted to solve the fragmentation problem, what you could do is you could have an aggregator of aggregators. Again, uh, Thanos is a project uh, that sort of does this for Prometheus, for example, right? Uh, at SignalFX, uh, 
we took a different approach. We said, if fragmentation is a problem, why can't we prevent fragmentation? So that's what we do. We store a lot of data in this hugely multi-tenant scalable system. And the way we deal with the load balancing is we will spread the data evenly across the whole cluster. So when there's an you know, increase in usage, the whole cluster grows up sort of gradually. It gives us time to react and prevent sort of hotspots from forming. The second problem, so even if you were able to store all this data, how well are you able to use it? How well are you able to query it? That's the next question. Because this data it just piles up and up and up and it causes slow queries. And you know, my view is observability nowadays is no longer about just telling me that you know, my container or my host is having a CPU problem right now. It is about making data-driven decisions. What I mean by that is using information to sort of make myself more efficient. So for example, I may want to capacity plan for this Christmas peak by looking at the trend from last Christmas peak, right? That seems reasonable. Uh, I may want to look at the cost and how cost of my infrastructure is scaling over the last couple of quarters, which may again require me to look at a lot of data. And if these queries are slow or not possible, then that directly uh, affects how well I can operate. So what can you do about that? Again, the classic let's throw money at the problem is sometimes quite effective. I know at least one very large valley company which does that, where they will store in memory the last week's worth of telemetry, which means a lot of those queries are going to go very fast. Uh, but another sort of more money efficient approach is to do pre-aggregation. So if you know that there are certain services, certain things that you like to observe over and over again, why not pre-aggregate them? So pre-compute, for example, an aggregate across 1,000 containers you know, running service X. And if you store that as its first class data stream itself, then there's far less data for you to query when you want to use it. It's going to be efficient. It's going to be fast. Obviously, it's typically not possible to do this for, do this for everything. You have to choose what you want to pre-aggregate, right? The signal effects approach, again, is slightly different. What we do is instead of doing aggregations across a service, we do a long time, right? This is good because a one-hour aggregate has 3,600 times less data than a one-second raw stream. And by doing this for every data stream individually, we are able to accelerate every query. So this is a, something that we do. The second problem, which is actually, in my opinion, more important, is churn. So if there's one thing you guys sort of take back from this talk, it should be an appreciation of churn. So to define churn, churn is when I take a data stream and I replace it with a equivalent one, right? So for example, let's say I deployed a new version of my service and I'm in Kubernetes. That means I'm going to start a whole new set of containers. Well, those new containers churn the old one, right? So the amount of data or events I'm going to get is the same, but the sources of them, the metadata, has changed. Another case is if I replace, for example, a, a cloud instance. So that's, a, that's churning that instance. And this thing goes on for you know, many, many different ways. But you're going to have a lot of churn. And churn has sort of two specific problems. So let me talk about the first one. We have a customer, Yelp, that most of you might be familiar with. You know how Yelp frequently will deploy their service? Is they will start a brand new Yelp. And then they will shut down the old Yelp if things look good. Imagine an infrastructure worth of new data coming up suddenly. Imagine the amount of new data as well as metadata. It's like a flood that hits you, right? So then the question is, how well, because you probably might be doing red-green yourself, right? So the question is, how well will your system handle this? Will it be able to handle this, this flood? Will it drop data? Even if it does not drop data, how quickly can it index all of this and make it available for querying, for alerting, for charting, right? And if you can do that effectively, again, your observability is going to be hurt. And one way to do that, again, as usual, you probably see a trend here, you can throw money at the problem, especially in terms of handling the flood. If you have enough capacity, of course, you're going to be better off, right? But there are other sort of smarter things you can do too. So instead of turning everything on all of a sudden, if you sort of gradually turn on your new infrastructure, that gives time for your monitoring system to react, right? Which is a, a pretty good thing. But there's even worse problems with churn, and that it makes things worse. So I call it the slow kiss of death. So what happens is Yelp, they are not just pushing the new Yelp once. They're doing it every day or sometimes multiple times, right? So they will do keep on doing this relentlessly. What this means 
is the metadata keeps growing and growing and growing and growing over time. If I wanted to look at a one year chart, and if I'm pushing code daily, I have to stitch together 365 different segments to see that whole view. And that is obviously bad because slow query performance, but it's worse because it's gonna slowly kill your monitoring system because they have their limits. Influx, for example, will be able to handle some number of data streams time series in, in per node. And if you go 300 times, I can guarantee you it's probably gonna fall over, right? So what can you do about it? Again, uh, pre-aggregation is a good answer for this. So even though my containers are changing, if I pre-aggregate, if I compute uh, the aggregate of the service and keep that as a first class data stream, that's great because now I can query a small set of data which is consistent that is not you know, uh, having churn and that at least my slow queries will be fast. And Prometheus, for example, has support for something like this called recording rules. But one problem I did not mention while speaking about pre-aggregation is that all pre-aggregations suffer from what's called the delay versus accuracy trade-off problem. So let's say I have a thousand containers and I'm gonna pre-aggregate an average across all of them. Well, if I generate my result very quickly, chances are not all those thousand have sent me the data yet, so I'm gonna get a partial result. I'm gonna get an incorrect result which is gonna give me false alerts, which is not great. Now I could say, well, I want accurate results. I want, you know, not no false alarm. So I'm gonna wait a little bit for, to let the data come in. But now the problem I got is I am not aware of problems that happened until five, 10 minutes after the fact. And if you want three, four nines of uptime, like there, there goes your chances, right? So this is a very, very, very hard problem, right? The way we solved it in SignalFX, and which is I think the only way to really solve this problem is your pre-aggregation must understand timing of all your data streams individually and figure out dynamically how long to wait. And that's sort of a, exactly what we implemented in our streaming analytics engine, but sort of it's a more technical discussion we can get into later. The last thing I wanna to touch upon is correlation. As you can see from this picture, like correlation is very, very important for us to understand uh, what's going on. Why is that? So if you again look at a typical Docker Kubernetes environment, just see the amount and variety of data that's available to me that I must all actually collect to be effective. And this is a problem because these data types, if I'm not able to go across them, if I'm not able to look at everything together, then what I'm gonna end up doing is I'm gonna have sort of this uh, tunnel view syndrome, right? So I'm gonna go and monitor, let's say the CPU, which is an infrastructure metric separately from the, you know, maybe my API latency, which is an application metric, separately from some other metric. What that would mean is I'm gonna have too many alerts. So I'm gonna have alert fatigue, I'm gonna have sort of, again, tunnel vision, right? It's much better because all of these problems, they're not unrelated. When a problem happens in an application, maybe it's because the container is under stress and maybe that's because the underlying VM is under stress. So we need to be able to look across all of these together. And this is something that your typical OSS or whatever won't solve for you. You have to solve it yourself. And the way to do that is through careful data modeling. So you must have metadata that lets you correlate these different data types. Uh, uh, example I have here is, let's say you know, my VM is reporting metrics uh, with an, uh, an instance ID. Well, if there's a container running on that VM, it should not only send me the container ID, but also the instance ID so that I can go back and forth between my container and my uh, VM telemetry, right? Similarly, an application running in that container should send me application ID, container ID, as well as instance ID, so that again, I can go back and forth between them. Doing this carefully uh, at the beginning as you get started off is gonna pay dividends over and over again, right? It's gonna solve the ability uh, to correlate across data types. But that's not enough. Uh, when an incident happens, we need to look across data types, not just data sets. Uh, so, you know, observability is built on these three pillars, right? So metrics will tell us that, you know, hey, there's a problem. A trace might help, might help me isolate where the problem is. And, but the log will tell me exactly what the problem is, right? So what specific exception or error, et cetera, that happened. So when an incident happens, the operator will want to go back and forth between these different data types to figure out what's going on, to solve, to root cause analyze the issue, right? 
And if that is hard, if they have to manually switch context, if they have to copy this context over and launch different tools, we are basically making their workflow ineffective. It's going to be slow. That's going to directly affect your MTTR and your SLA, right? And the answer in this case, again, is very similar. We must have data modeling that's carefully applied in the beginning so that I have metadata that binds together, sort of join keys for me to go back and forth between these different data types. But just having those keys is not enough because again, we, don't, we want to take the manual out of it as much as possible. So if you build integrations, which is basically point and click ways for you to go from, let's say, the metrics tool to your logs tool, back to your traces tool, and vice versa, that's going to make the operator's workflow that much more efficient during an incident, and they're going to be able to find and troubleshoot issues quickly, right? So these are the three that I wanted to sort of highlight. Uh, in terms of takeaways, what are the takeaways? So basically what we talked about was that, look, containers, uh, uh, Kubernetes are allowing us to move bus faster, but these are more complex systems. So observability becomes very important, yet it is harder. Uh, open source will let us get started, but they will not solve all problems, right? So there are things that you must do uh, to sort of prepare yourself to be more e effective. We talked about three different problems. Scale that causes things to be inefficient, uh, causes sort of hotspots, at the same time causes slow queries, which prevents some very important use cases from becoming reality. We talked about churn, which causes huge floods of data to potentially hit us, and also over time slowly kills the performance of your monitoring system. And we spoke about correlation and how the lack of it can make the operator's workflows inefficient, right? But there are things you can do. You can be very, very rich, and you can throw a lot of money at it. Uh, or you can also do lots of smart engineering things. So basically, don't just adopt the tool, also put some engineering behind it, right? Things like pre-aggregation, things like data modeling, things like building point and click integrations. These are ideas that are going to pay you back, and they're going to make your overall system successful. So I would say, you know, invest in that or use a tool that will do that for you. And uh, that's where I'm going to end. Uh, happy to have a discussion at our booth. Uh, we obviously have free trials and SWAG, et cetera, going around. So hope to uh, see you there. And with that, I'm going to end. Thank you very much.